All right, uh, let's call the January 24th, 2018 uh, Heinsberg Planning Commission meeting to order. So first item of business is agenda changes. Does anyone have an agenda change? Okay. Second item, public comments for non-agenda items. Nobody in the audience tonight at this point. So we will move on to number three, housekeeping changes to zoning and subdivision regs. I think the last thing we discussed last time was lighting, 529. Uh, it looks like you have a bullet on here uh, to go through some um, additional items from Mitch. Yeah, I, had, I should have had a first bullet saying finish the finish the uh, comments you got from the public hearing. I'd forgotten we hadn't made it through them all. So I think you're right, yeah. Joe. We, we'd yeah, made it we, through the zoning regulations up through 529. So if you are if you have the summary document with the public comments integrated into it, this is a document that's nine pages, and it's the first page. It's dated January 5th. I think we ended up on page 6. 529 so you still have a bit more to do on the zoning regulations and then jumping into the subdivision regulations subdivision. is that your recollection joe that's my recollection and that's what the minutes say too so yes i noticed don i depend had, on those have that in there it was helpful don thank you So you had you had agreed to make the changes that missy had suggested that's where he left off and moving on from there, I don't think there were any comments about the remainder of the zoning regulations, the, the various updates to the definitions, for example, and, and that sort of thing, at, either at the hearing or submitted in writing. Yep. Okay, so we are on the subdivision. All right. So the subdivision subdivision regulations are is a different document, of course, uh, and we did get a bunch of comments on the first suggested change, this business about collapsing the boundary line adjustments and transfer of land to a joiner into a single category, um, and I think the the big change or the the change that engendered some conversation was. Should a survey be required? We don't require one now for these kinds of things, but should one be required in the your draft proposal was to require a survey. I mean, to me, you know, survey is a specification. And in my world, we operate on specifications. Uh, it's clear, um, or hopefully more clear than not having a survey. Did you understand Roger Cohn's uh, comments about how there are times, like a survey's a good idea, but there are times where he felt it wasn't necessary to properly describe, you know, what was going on? He had emailed his comment. Well, yeah, I, I read Roger's comments. Um, I mean... What is easy to understand by one is maybe not easy to understand by another. And over the span of 20 or 50 or 100 years, it gets even more unclear. Um, well, you know, I, I, I don't want to repeat, you know, the conversation that we already had several weeks ago. Um, but I, I just, you know, I agree with the Roger that it, um, surveying is expensive. And um, there are, you know, fairly simple adjustments between neighbors that will just, you know, that could, could happen under the language now, but. Um, All right, so let me play devil's advocate. Who decides what's simple? and can be, you know, drawn on the back of a napkin and, you know, what is not simple and, you know, needs a survey. <laughs> I mean, 
Well, right now it's the it's the landowner and the and the attorney they have working with them. I think that was Roger's point to some extent was that as an attorney who does write up deeds, he was acknowledging that he does need something to go on. He can't just write up a deed for a transfer without any reference. Um, but I think his point was uh, sometimes those those uh, appropriate reference points are are available. Um, on the ground and don't require a surveyor to locate them and he can make reference to them in his deed and uh, but ultimately it would the way it works now it would be it, it's up to the landowner and their attorney to figure that out sometimes a survey is done because they, they feel like they want one other times not not to say that there aren't times than when when you know one really should be done and it's not that, well, that does I mean, happen <laughs> So say, for example, um, like just to um, say, for example, you have two parcels of land owned by two separate people, and um, they're going to do a boundary line adjustment be between the two of them. Um, and there is a survey that exists for one parcel, and there's a survey that exists for the other parcel. Uh, the cost then of doing that boundary line adjustment is probably pretty modest, virtually you know, simple, I'd assume, and not costly. Uh, it gets more complicated when one person has a survey and the abutter does not, although usually if one person has a survey, um, the line between their properties is also already delineated. And even in a circumstance like that, I would say that the added work to do that boundary line adjustment and incorporate it into a survey is pretty modest. Uh, if in situations like, um, hey, there's no survey whatsoever, there's maybe some reference points like Alex is talking about, and you're making a boundary line adjustment, in those circumstances, that just seems to me to be fraught with complications going forward, especially if as Joe says, hey, there's a real history of, you know, 50 years goes by, and there's, you know, the reference points are obscured, and so from my vantage point, there's no disadvantage to requiring a survey, uh, because in the latter <coughs> circumstance, it really sort of makes something clear that is probably pretty foggy uh, in, in many instances. So, and in the other two, it's pretty simple. So it just strikes me that this is not a particularly onerous requirement. And when it is onerous, it probably helps clarify circumstances. So um, I, I think we talked about this when I was. Yeah, we, we've had the discussion, and, and we don't need to have it again. I think the um, consensus is to. Yeah, if you're all in the same this. place you were before, given the you know yeah. one one public comment for one against and and a more nuanced one, then mm -hmm. that's fine. You can leave it as is. So I heard from three of eight and seen some heads, you know, nodding up and down. And, yeah, same. And thing. maybe side to side. I'm not sure. Yeah. <laughs> but, but I would think if there's a need for a boundary adjustment, then there must be some confusion. So straighten it out <laughs> legally. Well. I mean, that's a good point, too. Sometimes boundary adjustments have to be done because somebody parked a structure that happened to be <laughs> um, over so they didn't understand the line. Did Roger go and say why he uh, was opposed to it? Yeah, in his email he explained that as an attorney who writes up um, deeds for boundary line adjustments, he needs a reference point to base the, the deed language on. Um, so it is important to have that. And his point was that sometimes that is a survey and other times uh, there are other reference points that don't require a survey to him for him to write a uh, unintelligible deed that uh, flows. So I think he was saying sometimes it, it is warranted, other times it's not necessary. But it sounds like the consensus is you 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 just want to you want it to be a requirement. Andrea did recommend adding definitions of the term survey and partial survey. Um, with all due respect to Andrea, I think it's widely understood what a survey is. But I think her comment about you may disagree. Um, I think her comment about what a partial survey means, or at least in 
um, the section where these changes are being made, uh, maybe another sentence indicating that a partial survey of only the area being transferred is is allowable, and that's what we mean by, um, you know, a, a parcel not being fully surveyed. The, the way the language is proposed, it would read, um, it would read that in addition to any other information required by the zoning administrator, the application for a boundary line adjustment shall shall include. Names, addresses, and signatures of all owners of all parcels involved, and a survey of the land being conveyed. The survey shall note the acreage of the original parcels and any and the resulting parcels. And then uh, it says an approximate acreage is acceptable for parcels that are not being fully surveyed. So I, I think I think maybe another sentence in there before the approximate acreage last sentence saying, um, you know. A, a clarifying that a survey of uh, a full survey of the properties is acceptable or uh, a partial survey of only the area being transferred is also acceptable might address Andrea's concern. What do you think? I think the sentence that you read sort of does address it before the last sentence you read. That the one that says an approximate acreage is acceptable for parcels that, that are not being fully surveyed. Right. That implies that it's okay not yeah. to do a full survey. Um, I mean, we could state that. Uh, I'm just trying to get after what her suggestion was, if there's some confusion about what that. I, I don't have a problem with the addition that defines no. a partial survey as a survey of just the, the land being transferred. Yeah. I'm starting to learn I like clarity. Okay. You know, when, when something implies, yeah. that is am ambiguity to me. So. Ambiguity, is that even a word? Ambiguous. Oh, I liked it though. Yeah, <laughs> thank Whether you. It is or not. <laughs> so I, I'm not opposed to putting clarifying terms in the statement. Everybody okay with that? Yep. It doesn't change the. I just don't understand it. how you would just survey partially. You can do just one line. Right, but how do you know where to start from? Well, I mean, if, if, if you take <laughs> Ralph's. I mean, that's what Ralph's the whole. Just so this is, isn't well, it? It's ultimately, you don't know where you're starting. Well, if you're, that's a that's a decision the surveyor will yeah. have to make. If the right. surveyor says, um, "I can't prepare a, a legal survey for you without doing the entire right. property boundaries," then they're stuck with that. But if a surveyor says, <clears throat> "This line that you're doing the transfer with your neighbor on is very clear because of these monuments that I can reference in your deeds, then they might be able to survey in just that line and the and what's how that's changing without having to go to the back 40 and reconstruct the entire boundary of the property. But I, I think that a I think that we can leave that to the discretion of a surveyor. They're licensed, they're not going to create a survey that they can't they they gotta put their name to it, you know. All right, so I'll add a sentence in there clarifying the partial survey implication. Otherwise, everybody good with that? Yep. So the next section that there were public comments on is on the next page. Yeah, the landscaping standards. This was a good catch by Andrea. We had made some changes in the zoning regulations and the subdivision regulations have that same language in it for landscaping. So we just need to carry those through. Everybody okay with that? Mm -hmm. And then the next one was a pretty substantial conversation about yep. building envelopes and the philosophy of building envelopes and whether they should be the, uh, the, mo <clears throat> the most possible uh, with the resources uh, helping guide or the least possible. Uh... So competing interests here. I mean, the way I the way I took the commentary is is basically opening up the building envelope so that you can. I'll say it probably incorrectly, but. You know, clearing clearing more land, opening up you know a, a bigger impact on the environment. All right, and the competing the competing thing we're trying to do is 
if the if the building envelope was specified in one place on the on the map and they wanted to move that, we didn't want them to have to come back to the board. All right, for a for a simple move. Um, is there something that can strike a compromise between those two things? Let's say if you specified a building envelope that was, uh, you know, square feet or something like, you know, square meter, something like that. And what I can say is that one of Mitch's suggestions that we'll get to in his memo when you finish with these comments was uh, to eliminate what the intention was here of, of of allowing certain building envelope changes to not have to come back to the DRB. There was, there's some contorted language in here to say that building envelopes could be shown on the engineering and not on the plat so that if changes were required, they could be done administratively. And Mitch argued the point with me and I, I he convinced me. We can talk about that more with, with all of you. Um, but just know that he recommended that it, building envelopes are important enough that when they are changed, they ought to just go back to the DRB and have a re-explanation of, you know, what the issue is and that sort of thing. With that in mind, I think the, 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 the real sort of philosophical question is, do you allow a landowner to have the maximum area possible in, within which to build as long as you're not impacting any resource areas? Or do you do you um, create building envelopes that are as small as necessary for building so as to uh, minimize disturbance and and instead require a landowner to demonstrate why they need a larger one? I think that's the crux of it. And the proposed language was trying to say, give them as much space as they as they can have as long as there are no resource impacts so that they have lots of elbow room to build that extra barn, the garage, the addition to the house 20 years down the road without having to flex the building envelope at all because it's a sizable envelope. And I think both Andrea and Peter were saying, no, it's just the opposite. You know, it, they should, we should minimize the envelope area and then whenever they need to make it bigger, they should come and, and justify why. Yeah, I, I thought it was much as much the shifting when we had this original conversation as it was the size. Well, that's part that's part of the impetus behind the suggestion for the housekeeping change, which was make building envelopes more flexible so that we don't have so many projects going back to the DRB post subdivision approval um, for minor changes to envelopes when. Those those requests come in, the DRB looks at it and says, yeah, you're still not impacting any resources. Of course you can move the building envelope another 20 feet. Uh, so that the objective with the change was to say, let's just make the building envelope as large as, it, as, the, as the resources would allow it to be in the first place, and hopefully that will avoid this yeah. shifting and, and having to come back. Does that come up a lot? Like yeah coming back yeah it's it it's just a it's just inevitable it seems that the the subdivider identifies a small building envelope to placate the development review board mm -hmm. because there is you know there is this wisdom that smaller is less impact less uh, clearing less stormwater runoff um and inevitably, the moment they sell that lot to an actual person who wants to build, the homeowner says, well, they didn't actually put the building envelope exactly where I want it, or I need a house that's going to shape like this. And we, I don't know it, what the percentage is, but a healthy percentage of approved subdivisions are okay. seen, again, by the DRB for, for building you envelope Most positions. of the time, it's not that they're building more buildings. It's they just want it in Somewhere a different else. spot, yeah. you know, more over this way instead of. That's Oftentimes, they they seem to be minor shifts too. It's not yeah. like the building envelope was in this corner of the parcel, and now it's going to be in the opposite, you know, corner, thousands of feet away. It's it's here's the envelope, and we want to be on the, you know, just on the corner of it and extending. Uh, beyond I mean, why it couldn't it be like if they're just doing that that they could just become, you know, if they're not adding any buildings or anything, but just shifting it. How is that adding to the stormwater? 
You know what I mean? Yeah, I, I don't I don't think it is. I, but I think that the I think that the concern that Andrea and Peter raised was that the way this draft language reads, it encourages the DRB um, to yeah. have large building envelopes, as large as they can possibly be, so as not to impact any resource areas. So can we can we limit it some way? I mean, it, what it, like in terms of the the shift that people are looking for. Are we talking 20 feet? Are we talking 50 feet? I mean, is there, can we come up with a number or some reasonable, without just opening up the whole? Well, so again, I'm trying to get Mitch's comment in, in your minds at the same time. He really feels like even minor revisions to the building envelopes that are approved on a plat ought to come back before the DRB or the public hearing because neighbors had expectations about where buildings yeah. would be placed and so on and so forth. Um, so, you know, if, if you agree with Mitch on that front, then it's not so much a matter of how do you deal with a shifting building envelope as it is a matter of how large should they be to, to start? Should they be expansive so as not, but, but while not impacting resources or should they be the minimum necessary per the, de the, the developer who's doing the subdivision? Maybe it's too complex, but you know, <coughs> set a set a square area for a building envelope, right? Set a set a nominal placement on the map, and in you know allow a variance of you know x number of feet or several you know whatever rotation. Um, yeah, I suppose you could write some language on that front that the building envelope shall be identified to 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 be the the minimum necessary to accommodate the development while avoiding sensitive resources and that that building envelope may be allowed to shift um but it's problematic i mean it's still going to end up back in front of the drb if you if you agree with mitch's take so i, I don't know that you gain well, anything from that i mean it, i mean it, it, if you if you write in a size and, and you write in that that the nominal placement is on the map and that that placement can shift you know north south east west or rotate by x amount and they stay within that i, I wouldn't expect it to be back before the drb if yeah they, the, if, the, if, if, if they can't stay within all those constraints yeah it comes back to the drb my concern is that um and, and frankly i hadn't i hadn't really given much thought to the impact of a large building envelope i figured if it was if even a Regardless of the size of the building envelope, if it was not impacting a resource area, it was fine. My, my biggest concern with building envelopes is that we do draw them to avoid those sensitive resource areas. And if we start allowing them to move northeast, southwest, well, there have to be language that says, but only if oh, it absolutely. doesn't impact a resource oh, area. Absolutely. But the building envelope was, in my mind, should have been drawn to avoid them in the first place so that it's just a difficult conversation right. to have well, without I mean, I mean, looking at the actual property. Yeah, I mean, what, what kind of got into my head was, all right, um, if you really want to constrain the area, then I would hope that that, that building envelope is smaller than the non-encumbered area of the parcel. I, you know, there there's much more area there that doesn't impinge on resources than the building envelope itself. Which means that the building envelope could move within that area without sure. impact. I mean, you know, as a requirement, you don't impact the resources because that you know that that really does go back to the heart of you know the subdivision and the placement. You know, primary resources, secondary resources. Yeah, yeah. So, so. Oh, sorry. Go. I just have a question. So, by what we mean, so building envelope. When I look up building envelope, it's you know. Where the end, it's basically the building, the interior to the exterior space, that's your building envelope, correct? Or are we talking about the lot? So it's an area on the lot where you can place Where you buildings. can place buildings. Any, any building. Garage, well, house, usually shed. Usually larger yeah. by a reasonable amount than the anticipated uh, area in which you're going to build. Right? Yeah, it's definitely be. not the, the footprint. It, it's, uh, like Ralph said, it's, it's larger so that there's wiggle room to rotate a building, at, put an addition on someday in the future. Or different yeah. size building. That okay. sort of thing. I have a question, too. I mean, do we typically see, I mean, I think part of this is the development review process, but um, 
do we, would you say that typically we see applications that involve subdivision <coughs> and the designation of a, 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 a building, a footprint area, um, are those thoughtfully done, would you say? I mean, I know that's somewhat subjective, but my, my experience, I guess I'll say, is that oftentimes, other than some assessment of the resource areas, that this is sort of a pell-mell process. I don't, yeah. I don't typically see, um, especially if it's a development for sale, um, sometimes there's some attention paid to adjoining properties so that yeah. uh, that building envelope doesn't adversely impact, especially if there's several lots that are going to be sold. Um, there's some of that kind of attention. I, I don't typically see a, a tremendous of amount of, of uh, science or thoughtful yeah. consideration given to the size or placement of those, which, which tells me that the notion of coming back for further review, should you wish to adjust, seems like a good idea because I don't typically see that first blush being a particularly mm -hmm. A sensitive one, I guess yeah. you could say. It's it's just kind of like, all right, we got to do this, so let's do it. And well, I, mean, um, I, 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 the more I think about this, the more I wonder about the mechanics too. Is, is well, I mean, and I can think of two examples here. One is okay. I just bought the lot. There's nothing on it. I want to place my house. You know, who's the you know who is the the you know arbiter of whether you know i just placed my house in the building envelope or not and two is 20 years later when i want to build that outbuilding you know and i come in and i file my building permit i mean who who looks at that for for compliance with you know a building envelope oh the zoning uh, the zoning yeah and we're and supposed to we're supposed to have these building envelopes delineated on the plat with relationship to monumentation so that if it was unclear to the zoning administrator, they could compel the landowner to have it staked so they could go out there and measure it out. Um, so that does happen. Um, but I, 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 do, I do agree with Ralph. I think that in planned developments where the subdivider will be building the homes, it's very well thought out. And they, we don't see a lot of changes in, in coming back for building envelope revisions, right? Um, it's the case where you're where the subdivider is going to be selling these lots, and and the people who buy the lots are then going to be making decisions about the placement of the home, where we frequently see the revisions needed, and so it's not that there isn't any thought given to the envelopes; it's that the development review board and staff dictates to the applicant, these are the areas you must avoid, draw a building envelope that doesn't impact these areas. And beyond that, it, it's mostly what you said, you know, some de deference perhaps to neighboring landowners that a developer or a subdivider is trying to, you know, not disrespect during the subdivision review process, but that's about it. Um, and it's, and the, the eventual homeowner you know, may have a very different idea of the type and, and shape of a house and, and additional buildings that they want to place on the lot than the developer ever had. So, you but know, were the, setbacks made so that you didn't affect your neighbors? Well, and that's that's part of you and I have talked about this, Dennis, that that's part of why this proposal was to try to, um, you know, give people even more elbow room, because were it not for a subdivision, a regular lot is controlled in terms of where you can place buildings on it strictly by the setback provisions, which is 20 feet from side property lines, 30 from the rear, 60 from the center of the front uh, yard where the road is. Um, is so that fairly that, universal, those statistics? Uh, well, I mean, I'm telling you what they are in Heinsburg. Outside uh, of the village area. Yeah, yeah. Generally, those are the setbacks throughout most of town. Okay. Um, so it's only when you have a subdivision that we that we get into the business of 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 further refining that into a much more a much smaller area than the, than what the setbacks uh, indicate. And so again, the, the impetus for this proposal was well, if 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 that's an okay way to do development elsewhere, why not give folks who are creating lots through subdivision the same flexibility as long as they're not impacting any resources in the process. But then I. 
your point or someone's point about that, you know, adjoining neighbors may have attended the subdivision hearings or whatever and, you know, given input and um, and so if if changes are allowed without the people coming back for um, back to the DRB, then that doesn't allow input from yeah, and that's yeah, it does, though, because you have to go get a zoning permit, and then they can. You know what I mean? If you wanted to build. Okay. Yeah, I do. I do. You have to. Yeah, but there's it's a different kind of conversation when you when someone goes to get a zoning permit, um, the neighbors know about it only if they happen to see the post the notice posted on the property. And there's no chance to discuss what might have been a building envelope revision that nobody heard about. Whereas when it comes back to your board, a neighbor gets a letter in the mail. They can come sit at a meeting, understand what's happening, and make an intelligent comment about that. I, I've, I've flipped. Mitch convinced me. I think these all should go back to the DRB when they need to be revised. For that reason, um, and in case the regulations have changed in some way, and maybe there's a new vernal pool map that we now have that you know is important to consider um so could there be more flexibility on making the building envelope in the first place well i think that's what i want you to really wrestle with because that's what andrea and peter were saying is like uh regardless of whether you make people come back to change them you know they were saying make them small to begin with and the, this proposed language says make them big to begin with. So you need to decide which which philosophy you want to do on that front. So I think Peter was impatiently waiting in the back to probably oh, say I the same thing. Little, and I'm a little louder than in the new the iteration of the regulations, but we did really, I think, put a lot of effort into the original building envelope. So we wrote, there's a house. Oh, here, Peter, there. sorry. <laughs> I'm getting that. But when we drove to the house, I don't think it was ever built. And we spent a lot of time trying to make sure that the location of that building envelope didn't allow a normal house to go up over the ridge line so that it wouldn't be absorbed by the background. <coughs> David Zuckerman's farm down here, we did the same thing for his lot. That we worked really hard on trying to get that original envelope. And I don't think these are protected areas. This is, this is the concept of being absorbed into the visual landscape in the rural areas. And I don't think that's protected in any verbal way in our regulations. It, it, it was in the, in the subdivisions, but it isn't, it, I don't think it's a mandated protected. Well, actually, Peter, it, it, it was in the regs. That's why it was, that's why we compelled those people to make those changes was no, because. No, I, I don't say it was in the regs, but it isn't like a wetland or steep right. slopes or something right, right. like that. Right, right, right. But, so my point was the, the proposal was only meant to say, if, for example, in the Weed Road case, um, the area within which they could have met all those requirements was very large, this, this language says, give them the largest possible area. And your comment at the hearing was, well, yeah, but even if it could have been large, it should still be small so that the corollary sorts of impacts from additional buildings and such would be minimized. And that's what I'm trying to get them to think through is that philosophy of, should it be as big as it can be without having you know negative impacts on our standards, or should it be you know as small as possible only to accommodate the development? You might as well hold on to that. You're the only one who needs it. <laughs> I just think all the discussion you're having is saying let's leave it the way it is that they have to go back to the TRP. Well, I, I, I do think that, but the question still remains. Do, <laughs> Do you want to give the DRB guidance about how large or small to make these building envelopes when there are no other constraining factors? Meaning, we have dealt with all the resource areas, we're avoiding all of those, and now you have two acres of unconstrained, unencumbered land left on this lot. Should the building envelope be two acres, which would be an exceedingly large building envelope, or should it be, you know, much smaller than that? But by going back to the DRB, that's the reason you go back, so that they can help you decide. No, what I mean in the first instance, when the subdivision is first happening, should that Still. should that lot that's being created, the building envelope be the two acre larger size or the half acre size? Well, isn't that up to the DRB to decide? That's why you go before that board. 
Well, I think part of the reason this language is here is because it hasn't been, that hasn't been clear. And so the DRB has tended to err on the side of very small. And if we want to do that, I think the regs should back them up and explicitly say that, which is what Peter and Andreas recommended. Yes. But if, if, you, if that's not the philosophy and the philosophy is give them as much room as they, as they could have without impacting things that our regulations say they should avoid, then we should say that too, you know, one or the other, I guess. So let me ask another clarifying question. So if I've got the large building that's below, if I'm hearing you right, I've, I'm doing a subdivision. I say, here's all the land that's outside of the boundaries that I have to play with, and I can put my building anywhere within this two acres. Is that the general gist of it? Yep. And then I have to go to the DRB, and normally I would say my building's going to be here, or I can just say it's going to be around here. No. Anywhere in that building. Anywhere can, in that building. Yeah, anywhere. <laughs> so I'm just trying to think of, uh, you know, I get the pros of that, right? It gives me flexibility to put my house where, where I want within that space. Um. But let's go, what's the negative side of that? So I've heard neighbors might think it's going to be here, but it's there. That's not, You know, when would they get caught that out should, by that, that, you know? That shouldn't really be an issue because the neighbor who participated in the original subdivision review would should see that, the, that a two-acre build building envelope this, has been proposed and that they could build anywhere in there. So there shouldn't be surprises on that front. I think the, the cases that Peter and Andrew brought up, and Peter, you're here, so you yeah. can speak to it, but is, um, let's say it's two acres, mm -hmm. and um, and in the end, the homeowner who buys that lot, it's, let's say it's a 10-acre lot and there's a two-acre building envelope, decides to build... Um, on the far end, you know, corner of those two acres and ends up building the longest possible driveway to get to that house site. Mm -hmm. um, versus if the Development Review Board had said, yeah, there's no constraints in those two acres, but we really want you to specify a half acre building envelope and, um, and it gets placed much closer to the road and the driveway would be much shorter. Um, that's, okay. that's part yeah, yeah. of where you could have increased impacts. The other would be the larger your building envelope, the more buildings you can throw into it, right? right. I can build a barn, a garage, a, a work shed, or whatever. Where does this um, compel you to come back to the DRB if all of a sudden you said, hey, I want to build a, a barn and I right. need a new building envelope? If you had here. a half-acre building envelope, you might run right. out of space, right. basically. Right. I mean, that's another possibility. Uh, a third one is that oftentimes in wooded areas, we use the building envelope as a surrogate for... Um, limiting how much area can be cleared, mm -hmm. how much woodland can be cleared. We assume right. that you could potentially clear everything within the building envelope. Right. Um, and so if, if in those circumstances you identify a smaller building envelope, you necessarily um, uh, limit, you know, the amount of, of forest clearing, right. which, you know, can be a good thing. Yep. Yep. But even if the woods were outside the building envelope, they could still clear the woods. And they could unless the board imposed a clearing limit that was right. snapped to the envelope. And it, it just depends on the property. We don't establish forest clearing envelopes in addition to building envelopes on every project. Um, so what, what type of areas has the DRB been working through? I mean, what's, it, what's an average building envelope that the DRB is, is mandated in well, other you know, issues we have is like a subject. big, a big parcel. They want to have two because they're not sure which one they want to build on. They want to have that option, right? We've had that yeah, before. Yeah, either a large enough envelope that there are multiple positive building sites that a future buyer could have the option of picking, or multiple envelopes, um, which this draft language allows, or more specifically allows. But I understand what you're asking, Joe. I don't think that there's a I don't think there's a firm number. Peter did this for a long time too, so he he might have some thoughts. Uh, Dennis, you you've seen these projects. I want to say that on a ten acre lot, um, any an envelope more than an acre would would typically be seen as excessively large, and we, and the board would often say, "Can you shrink 10%. shrink that down?" So it's our, so it's proportional to the size of the lot obviously well I mean, not necessarily lots, i'm just using that as a as an example yeah. so you can get your head around i think even on a 40 acre lot that was a single was 
was designed to be uh, used for just a single family home, they would still have the conversation about, you know, something less than an acre. Do, do you agree, yeah, Peter, based agree. on what you remember? I was just going to say, when we, years ago, we, used, did, the mic, <coughs> sorry, years ago we did Raymond Ayers subdivision uh, off of Gilman Road, and one or more of his lots there had a, a large area within which you could locate a building envelope. So that it, it, because we really, there was a pretty good size area that didn't have any of these, they have all like equally non-constrained. Um, and it worked out. I mean, I, I think that lot was sold. I'm not sure. Actually. Well, it sort of worked out. They haven't built out the entire subdivision yet. Um, but it wasn't, it was a, a unique way of defining a building envelope that sort of floated until they built the house. And then the building envelope was, was, the was a, yeah. yeah, it was keyed to that location. Sounds like a good compromise. Yeah, as an as an administrator, it's it's a, it's a little bit of a nightmare because um, why I don't well, know. It's not mapped for one thing. It yeah. Go back and make them monumented later somehow. Yeah, and that part of it is just my desire, kind of like your desire with the boundary line adjustments, to be tidy. You know, to have a, an approved subdivision that clearly lays out where water and sewer are going, where the building envelope is, where driveways are going. And the more you sort of make it wishy-washy, the less you certainty you have on that front. But another thing that's been happening is people come in for a subdivision and we're asking them to put their property in a building envelope. Which Me, what Dennis means is they're coming in for a subdivision of the property they already live on. So it has an existing house on it. They're creating a new lot in the you know back corner of the property. And the board is, is asking for a building envelope to be defined around the new development lot where nothing exists yet, but there's going to be a new house. And also around their existing house. Which is true. The board's been in the practice of doing that, especially when there are a lot of sensitive resources in the vicinity of that existing house. Mm -hmm. I think the Francis property was an example of that, right? The, the most recent one you guys did on, on Butternut Lane. I think Don I think and so. Kevin's existing house is sort of perched up on a pretty steep slope, and mm -hmm. they had to identify a building envelope around the house that they've been in for decades. I mean, shouldn't that be fairly straightforward? There's no guesswork there. There's are structures. No, it tries to anticipate, you know, future. the other outbuildings that they might want to build in the future. Yeah. Yeah. But it, it always feels awkward when we do that, but I don't, we don't get much pushback because I think of what Rolf said. That it's like, well, I already live there. I know where I might want to build in the future. I'll just draw a line around that and call it a day. But it, it is odd only in the sense that had they not subdivided, their building envelope would have been far larger, just constrained by the perimeter setbacks outlined in zoning. So it, they just get further constrained the moment they walk into a subdivision process. I, I guess it's, um, you know, at least uh, I don't feel like fully informed on this front, but, you know, if, if the general sense is, and you concur on that, that, hey, the adjustments that uh, are going to be made to these building envelopes are going back to the DRB anyway, that I don't really see a practical reason uh, for the language enlarging the building lot designation that the the building footprint allowable footprint I I would I don't even know what the language says right now but I guess I would it all, leave, it leave, it leave it as is. All it says right now is the Development Review Board may require building envelopes to be specified for some or all buildings. That's what it says yeah, now. I, I think there's, yeah. I mean, and Alex pointed this out before, I mean, there's a, I mean, there's a basic question here is, I mean, if you're, if you're going to have the DRB, right, right, Put the put the building envelopes in as as allowed. How big should those building envelopes be at the start? Right. They they've been going small. There's really no language, right? That in the present regs that that dictate large or small. They've been conservative. Um, you know, do we? You know. 
do we want to help the DRB, right? You know, by stipulating that building envelope should be. But do you think they need help? They're not qualified to do that. Uh, it, Two of them are. Um, <laughs> um, there you go. Well, let me let me let me let me qualify help. So yeah. So um, there's there's nothing there's nothing in the regs today that say DRB make them as small as possible. Right. So so if I come in and and I want a big building envelope and the DRB wants a small building envelope and you come to a disagreement and you know. The, the developer or whatever is not happy and you end up in court, right? Um, but that, that hasn't the, happened the yet. The DRB will lose in that case. But yeah. Marie's right. That hasn't happened. Generally, right. this, is not hasn't. A, this is not I, an issue that has driven a lot of controversy. Well, it's just an issue right. that we understand and uh, for various reasons, especially this people having to come back so frequently to make tweaks and changes. But I think that's I mean, the nature of the beast. Because it's also, I think, happens when people, so say maybe I had the building no. lot and then I sell it to somebody else. I might have lived there for 10, 20, 10 years. The next person has a different idea, and that's when they seem to come back. That's. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it, it, it may be as simple as saying that, that, that the DRB may not only, you know, set a building envelope, but the DRB is free to determine the, the size right. of the building envelope. Right. I like that. What it, so I didn't finish that sentence properly. What it actually says today is the, de the Development Review Board may require building envelopes to be specified for some or all buildings where it is necessary to carefully define building locations and heights in order to protect the natural features listed in this section and other features recommended for preservation in the town plan. So that's what the current language says. The proposed language is sort of similar, but then it goes on to say, make it big if you can. And so what the proposed language says is that the development of the board may, may require building envelopes to be specified for some or all buildings when necessary to protect natural features or ensure compliance with planning and design standards. And it references the regs. So it, <laughs> it's similar to what it says today, just m more specifically saying uh, to ensure compliance with our regulations. So I think uh, I think a second, if we wanted to get rid of some of this other language that says the DRB shall allow the envelope to encompass as much of the lot as possible, that could be replaced with the DRB um, shall determine um, the appropriate size of the building envelope. And you could even go so far as to say, you know, shall err on the side of, shall be conservative, uh, you know, err on the size of what is uh, necessary for the development proposed. Uh, so as not to be too big or so, something like that. Can I ask you a question and then I, I see Peter's got his hand up? Um, so it's just, it's it's kind of a process question. So let's say they, they, they say, okay, here's my lot and I'm going to subdivide it and here's my building envelope. Let's just say it's the bigger size building envelope. And they say, okay, you can build anywhere within there. And at what point does the, the person who owns that, that plot of land with that big building envelope come in and say, okay, here's my plan. I'm going to put a house here. And it's going to be whatever it is, and the DRB says that's good. And so people have had a chance to come in and look at the plan and say, yeah, okay, it's all good. What If they then want to build a barn or something in that building envelope, do they have to come back to the DRB so people can have something? Or is it no, just you no, can no. do whatever you want Once within that Once the subdivision thing. is approved with a specific building envelope, all that's needed to build within it, whether it's the house, a barn, a garage, a doghouse. For eternity or forever, forever. Is a zoning permit from the zoning administrator. And the only thing the zoning administrator is going to ask is tell, demonstrate to right. me that your proposed structure is in that envelope. As long as it is, then yeah. they're good to go. That's the point of the envelope is that they so, have flexibility to build anywhere within it. So I like... I like the flexibility of, you know, hey, I've just bought this property. I want to place my house somewhere within the land that I can. I, I like that flexibility. But I also want the ability for people to look at, you're doing a major change. You know, what does that look like? So there needs to be, I kind of like the one where the DRB has the discretion to say, well, you know, okay, we're going to narrow, you know, you could start this big and we're going to narrow it down and now here it is. I, I don't know. I mean, I know it's, it's a pain to have these people come back, but I think it's also kind of important in some way to know what's going on, but 
I'm just trying to understand the process and what it means. Two, two other things just to consider, which I haven't actually ever thought of. One is um, when you get your wastewater program, you, you've been engineered pretty tightly into a site. Yeah. And I have no idea how that changes. Only with regard to your septic system and your well. And your well. Well, and no, it depends on how far away you are from you know, your leach field. If you're moving another mm -hmm. 200 feet, you may need a bigger pump. You may need a bigger line. You may not have the gravity to run downhill. I, I don't know how this does, yeah. but I mean, it definitely would. And the other thing is, depending on how big the thing is and, and the, the uh, pitch of the lot, slope of the lot, uh, you've got to, the DRB makes you think about stormwater. And it doesn't take a whole lot of driveway to really change a stormwater picture. So, I mean, these are two technical engineered in things that come with the plan for, for that lot. Yeah, and I think Peter's, the, Peter's second point in particular is very significant with regard to our regulation. So we don't regulate water and sewer. The state does that. And if the, if the landowner demonst, you know, <coughs> provides us with a septic design and then later moves their house 100 feet away and it changes their septic design, we don't regulate that. They got to go deal with the state and that's their problem. But we do regulate stormwater, and we, we, we upgraded our regs in 2015 to say if it's 10,000 square feet or, or more, you got to have a design um, system. And there is the potential with an excessively large building envelope for an applicant to say, well, this is where my house is going to be, and it's not going to be an issue. And then when they actually go build it, it's much further away, and maybe it does become an issue. I could see that as being a reason to air on this, you know, be conservative on the building envelope uh, size. So what do you want to do? I think we suggestion about. So like a sugar house or something like that, they could build outside the building. Mm -hmm. Only if it was declared uh, exempt from zoning under this, the, as an agricultural structure. Otherwise, the, we've changed the definition of building envelope in, in the definition section of the subdivision regs. Currently, it says principal structure. We've changed that to say all structures, um, except for those under 100 square feet that don't require a permit, I think is what we said. So that would be an important conversation to have at the time of subdivision or coming back for a revision for somebody to say, hey, the subdivider never anticipated the sugar house I was going to build up on the hill. It's way, out, way outside of my building envelope. Can you give me dispensation to do that? Because, you know, it's not going to be an ag exam. So that's where you'd need to be able to have a second building envelope. Or some sort of special dispensation that doesn't change the envelope as much as it gives an exception for that particular structure. But we, yeah, that's been a pro that's been a problem infrequently um, <coughs> in various subdivisions. That's where the agricultural exemption is kind of convenient because uh, it's easy to say, "Oh, never mind. Sugar houses are exempt. You don't have to comply with building envelopes." But we've had that question come up with barns other sorts of structures that we've said, we don't want you out in the middle of that field that's ag soils. And then the applicant says, well, what if I want to build something that helps make me, helps me tend those ag soils? Can I put that out there? And that be, can become a little well, iffy. Right? It depends on the nature of the building. Sometimes they are. Sometimes, you know, the person wants to use them for multiple things and it's not clearly an agricultural building, so it doesn't enjoy the exemption. And, you know, then we just have a conversation about expanding the building envelope or providing some kind of an exception. The, the way this language reads is it says the board may require building envelopes to be specified, specified for some or all buildings. So I, I think that um, we tighten up the definition, but this language still gives the board the flexibility to bend and wiggle with particular structures. You can't it's have just difficult with building envelopes or no? Say again? Can you have multiple building envelopes technically on your Right lot? now the regs are not clear on that. Um, it, does, it, it does use the plural. The Development Review Board may require building envelopes with an S, but I, we've always tried to have a single envelope identified. This proposed language in the housekeeping changes does say, um, what does it say? 
multiple building envelopes on a single lot are permissible at the discretion of the DRB and with due consideration to access limitations. So the proposed language would allow you to identify multiple non-adjacent building envelopes at the discretion of the DRB. We've, we've tended to try to avoid that, but if we were to adopt this language, then we wouldn't have, we, it would be enabled. So is our choice to, uh, well, maybe that particular line could be added, but is our choice, is what we're, we're really talking about more or less keeping the language the way we used to have it or amending it to permit lots to be larger? And I, I guess if that's the distinction, I would elect or suggest that we keep it the way it was. Um, although I do like the suggestion or that sentence that says something about at the discretion of the DRB, um, multiple building lots might be proposed by the developer, I guess, however that's phrased. That sounded like a reasonable ad. I think your 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 shorthand for what the decision I'm trying to push you towards is is accurate. Uh, <laughs> keep it keep the philosophy the way it has been, or or make it make building envelopes larger. Which which one do you want? <laughs> yeah, I think uh, more oversight for maintaining the oversight that the DRE has now. I would, I would maintain the oversight, but I would I would really encourage a, a line or a modification statement to. Empower the DRB, right, to set the size. Okay. Right, and and you know, recommend that that be conservative. Should we change it to say the DRB will set a building envelope? Is there any situations where it doesn't make sense to, to set a building envelope? I think so. <laughs> I wanted the opposite. I wanted to build. I wanted it on the property where you couldn't build. You know, that's what I wanted. Right. You know, you just on that property where you can't build. Mm -hmm. I mean, it doesn't affect property owners that have one or two acres. It's the ones that have 20 or 30 or 40, mm -hmm. you know. You know, the person that wants to build a sugar house on the back side of their woods, mm -hmm. now they got to come to the DRB and get a building envelope instead of just a zoning permit. Uh, I guess. Isn't that only if they go through subdivision though, guys? If you have it. Yeah, if they're part of an approved subdivision with right. an existing yeah. building envelope. Yep. I mean, we aren't seeing too many subdivisions here. I can only think of one right now that has a large lot, and that's the O'Neill one. But the other problem is those these people that have large lots that are subdividing now they're being made to put a building envelope on theirs. Their, yeah, I didn't which realize I, that. I think that's. I don't like that idea. But. Mm -hmm. Well, the language as as it currently exists and as proposed change, if you're all on the same page of what's just been discussed, leaves that discretion at the board level. So. I'm not sure how that's come about anyway, so. It's come about purely from an, an understanding of where the sensitive resources are and that uh, if we're going to limit impacts on them for a new building lot, why wouldn't we also limit the impacts on those resources from additional building in, an, in proximity to an existing house? Like, what's the difference? Did development right, but I mean, that person subdivided could have, like, who knows, could have a six acre building envelope right they yeah. could i mean they could already have buildings spread sure. out all over the place sure yep but right they could yep and the moment they enter the subdivision <laughs> review process they no, get no, they no, get no. greater scrutiny that's all right but i mean their form of exercise but my point dennis is that it's at the discretion of the drb so if you two as drb members feel like there's overreach happening with regard to building envelopes around existing houses during the subdivision process just I mean, I think, I, I think I just you're greater flexibility and not, I mean, definitely look for issues, you know, wetlands and all that stuff. And, and the neighbors will know where that building envelope is. Mm -hmm. So it's not. Yeah, I guess I haven't been on the DRB long enough to really say, hey, 
this is an issue. I mean, I can, I'm like, thinking it. I've seen it at least three or four times at least that people have come back in, I think. Maybe more than that. Yeah. Oh, for building envelope revisions? Yeah, yeah they're, they're relatively common. But it's usually when somebody wants to build a building, another building out somewhere else. Isn't well, that usually when it happens? Well, usually lots of times it's, it's just moving the house a little bit. Yeah, whatever. usually it's the, the homeowner who buys the lot from the subdivider and okay. says, they didn't get it quite right, and I, my garage is going to need to be, you know, 20 right. feet outside of the building. I mean, usually they're not adding too much to it. No, it's usually it's minor, minor, minor right. shifts and such. So huh. can I can I try to wrap here? I'm is is there consensus to stay with small and empower the DRB as Joe said to make that determination? Um, and I'll, but but like Ralph said, allow there to be multiple envelopes at the discretion of the board. Yes. Is that the general consensus? Because I can write all that up and get it to you for review before this goes to the select board. Well, that was the last public comment on the subdivision regs. And then, as I mentioned, I, I circulated a memo from Mitch with some suggestions he had on the uh, subdivision regs. But I don't know if you want to do that or ask the two audience members if they had something additional since they're here. <laughs> if they have, well, Johanna they... hasn't hasn't said anything yet. No. I'm just here observing. Okay. They miss us. Yeah. So if I can just walk you through Mitch's suggestions, they're all fairly minor. Um, his first suggestion was on section three point one point five, and um, he's just he's he's just recommending deleting the end of of a sentence um, because it's not necessary um, since the, the the DRB won't be involved in boundary line adjustments anymore under these changes so that that's a logical change okay. um, anybody have a question about that okay um, the next is section 6.6.3 .6 on stormwater control for smaller projects um, this actually is a substantive change. I need to draft this and show it to you. But his point was, he said, I don't think the, the regs that we passed in 2015 are clear enough about what needs to be submitted for these smaller projects that don't trip the need for an engineered plan. Uh, uh, I would agree with that. And having gone through it myself, or at least tentatively gone through it myself. You did go it through it yourself. Clear. That's right. So um, so I'd like to draft some language to clarify that and, and, and clarify that we still will be looking for um, some kind of a plan and a narrative to explain how stormwater will be treated mm -hmm. and that that plan and narrative has to provide details about sensitive areas like steep slopes, poor drainage areas. Uh, Mitch thinks that areas where there's concentrated flow need to be discussed, um, ditches and such. Um, or places where there's deficient existing infrastructure like undersized culverts that are already there. So I, I can write that up. I think it's a good change. Um, okay. Do you, do you, do you, are you guys amenable to me writing something up on that? Or? Okay. Um, and then his next one was what we'd already discussed about uh, Section 6.10.7 on building envelopes. He really wants them to be depicted on the plat, not on engineering and he wants people to have to come back to the board to make revisions. Sounds like you're all in favor of that. Um, and then he had a couple other minor things. S Section 7.1, change the number of copies from three to two. We're getting digital now. We don't need all that paper. And Section 773, um, just revising wording, members of the public to interested parties. It's just more uh, consistent with statute. What happens to those two paper copies? So uh, we always used to ask for three because we want one for the file. We want to be able to give one to the road foreman and give one to the public works person. It used to be Rocky Martin. Um, and what's happening is that we tend to share digitally now. And so if we get two paper copies, one will be for the file and the other one will be an extra to like mark up, chicken scratch on, or even give back to the 
the landowner at some point to say, can you write, you know, make an adjustment here and here's a copy. Yeah. Uh, okay. So I think it's good to still get two versus just one. But with the digital versions, we our sharing options are, are easier. Okay. And it's really the full size plans where this becomes important, right? Because if it's small, we can photocopy it. But what these extra copies are really for poster size plans that we don't have the ability to, to copy. So if you're all good with Mitch's suggestions, the, the last item was something that, um, I apologize, I forgot to put back in front of you. During all this time when you've been talking about these changes the last couple of years, at, we had a meeting where we discussed convenience stores and retail establishments <coughs> and what the heck is the difference between those two and why are they differentiated in the zoning regulations? And I said that I would go out and look at what other towns had for um, uh, convenience store uses and their definitions and get back to you. And I, I did the work and then I forgot to get back to you. So um, if you have the document, it's on the table there. Uh, it's dated June 13th of last year. Um, and it, it gives you a, a proposed language that would collapse these into a single definition of retail establishments. And then it gives you an example of how they could be done uh, as separate definitions. My recommendation is, which I think I told you before, is just collapse them. We, we don't have an area of town that, um, that a convenience store would make sense for. In most of these other communities, retail uh, is differentiated from convenience stores in that uh, convenience stores might be allowed in districts that would not otherwise allow traditional retail because they want to have a neighborhood market, you know, in the middle of a neighborhood. And I don't, you may disagree, but I don't think Heinsburg is at a place where we need to have convenience stores up on Texas Hill Road or um, down on Baldwin Road. You know, I think that we are a small enough community that to restrict retail uses to our, our village growth area is sufficient um, and I think is consistent with actually more consistent with the town plan um, and and frankly the way it's the way it's written into our regs now these convenience stores aren't allowed in the rural areas it's just a I think it's just a holdover from uh, the past and in, in uh, the village district had one use type and the commercial district had another I think that it, they can just be collapsed and be fine. But as you can see, I gave you some examples of definitions from a whole bunch of other towns. I don't think a convenience store is the way you just defined it. You don't think so? No, I think of a convenience store as something something that has easy ingress and egress and, and, and sells a limited set of, of products that, that one might buy on the spur of the moment. Um, well, that is what I meant, even chips, though those soda, words didn't come out of my mouth. Yeah. You know. I would love to everything is free. It, no, convenient, no, Kenny Drugs would not be a convenience store. Ballard's would be a convenience store. The Mobile would be a convenience okay. store. Okay. So regardless of how you define it, mm -hmm. do you want it to be a separate allowed use in our zoning, or is it okay to, uh, to just collapse it into the retail establishment definition? So, so the only reason to have a separate definition would be if we wanted to allow convenience stores in the rural areas. That That's the right? argument I was trying to make okay. is that it doesn't make sense in your commercial zoning district to say we allow convenience stores and retail establishments because if you allow retail establishments, you are allowing convenience stores, right? But if you did want, say, in, in a special new zoning district out in the rural part of town, to allow a convenience store, then you could have a separate use that of that and not allow all the other types of retail, but only allow that one type, a, a convenience store type. But I, I don't think that's consistent with what we call for in the plan. Um, so, I, I, But that's just my opinion. Right now, any and all retail is limited to the village growth area, right? Yep. And commercial. And commercial. Yeah, the village growth area, uh, including all of the districts that make it up, which are village, village northwest, village northeast, mm -hmm. commercial, two yeah. of our industrial districts. Yeah. 
But how about the uh, the industrial district? If somebody wanted to repurpose that, the general store down there? That is not in the industrial district. That is in the agricultural district. It's on the wrong side of the road. Wrong side of the road. So it is a non-conforming use. Um, so what if somebody wanted to buy that and try again? They could as long as they continued the non-conforming use and didn't expand it in any way. Yeah. Uh, the owners of that store did come before the Planning Commission many years ago and, and request that the industrial district be expanded to come across 116 and sweep up their property so that they have more options for the use of that. Um, I think they asked for it to be commercial, Alex, but I could yeah, be I, wrong. I, I, I think but it was an expansion of industrial district, but in any case, um, similar. at that point, the planning commission said, no, it's the, the zoning's neighbors. fine and the store can continue as a non-conforming use. Right. It's just limited in, in, in its ability to expand. It, it was, was all the way to Tyler Bridge Road. Yeah. The neighbors showed up in force and were very much against it. Yeah, I think Dennis Casey in particular was not pleased with the idea. Because he owns a lot of the land around the back and wasn't interested. But then people even down on Tyler Bridge Road were very much against it. Well, and at the time, the commission, Joe would remember, but the commission said the Industrial One District is enormous right, right. now. There's really no cause to increase it. and um, It's just a matter of you know, seeing the development happen there, maybe when three-phase power comes along or the landowner is more interested in developing an industrial park. None of that is really relevant to this conversation except for the fact that that is like a convenience store. So it's a good it's good to bring it up. If you wanted to allow that specifically in the ag district, we could create a convenience store use, define it, and add it to the list of conditional uses in that district. The problem is then they could pop up anywhere in the district, which I think would run counter to the plan. So, so Jeff well, asked me a question, question yeah, about it. Yeah, it seemed like you had a concern or you had well, a thought there. Well, I, I, I didn't, but I've thought of one. Um, <laughs> okay. Is normal. So, so, so it starts off with something Maggie said. So, so convenience stores are retail establishments, but retail establishments aren't necessarily convenience stores. If, if you just say retail establishment, you are treating, right, all retail establishments as equal. And if you want to encourage more um, pedestrian friendly, village friendly sort of things, you probably don't want to encourage convenience stores because at least the way I think of convenience stores is they cater to the motoring public. Quick ingress, quick egress, you know, limited amount of stuff. So, um, if you, you know, if you want to discourage quote-unquote convenience stores, you need to be able to differentiate between what is a convenience store and what is a, re, you know, a normal retail establishment. If you don't want to, you know, if you don't want to um, bias, then you don't need to do that. I think economics is dictating that a lot of convenience stores are being built. It is our it, economy it, right now. Well, it, it, exactly, and, you know, how convenient store-ish do you want, you know? But I will say that a lot of people down our way, I used to see walking to that store. <laughs> Whether you believe it or not, it wasn't the greatest situation, but there were people that walked to it more than you would think. But I agree with what you're saying beyond that. So let's mush them together, shall we? Great. Mush. Is that a planning term? No? <laughs> it's a good term. Okay. Well, that's okay. popular in Alaska. Apparently, I did it right. There you go. Are you okay with that, Joe? Because you just threw a little monkey wrench yeah. into the conversation. Well, I, I mean, I, I'm, I'm, trying to, I'm, I'm trying to think of like. 116. What I what I want five more quote unquote convenience stores lined up on 116, between you know the brook and the corner. No, right. I would not want that, and that that is that is not the kind of development that I want to encourage in the village northwest or village northeast. What 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 is your what why are you thinking of a gas station or a convenience store? 
sort of well, they all are. Because, well, again, I mean, I mean my under these are, definitions, in order to survive, I mean, they well, no, are. but under these definitions, a convenience store is not a gas station. But and under okay. our regs right now, there can be no more gas stations in the Village Growth area. We're done. There's a there's so, a one thousand foot so or fifteen hundred foot separation store. distance that we wrote into so the So if I wanted quick ingress and egress like Ballard's but no gas station, it's not going to happen. The economy is dictating that's not going to happen. Well, so the, well, the example I mean, sooner, that I, sooner or later we're all going to be electric cars and there are, are going to be yeah, no pumps. But will right? we write our regs by then? Again? The example I'm thinking of, if you ever drive in the north end of Burlington, is on the corner of um, North Street and Willard. I think it's North Street and Willard, um, North Willard. Uh, there is a convenience store. It's a neighborhood market. I don't know right. that they would refer to themselves as a convenience store, but it's they a neighborhood market. It's a. It, it doesn't have gas pumps. It's just. It just has these kinds of sundries that people can pop in and grab what they need quickly. Mm -hmm. um, so when Joe, when you say you know, as the Village Northwest builds out, you wouldn't want to see two or three more convenience stores. I think of those neighborhood markets, and I say, why wouldn't you? That that's kind of a cool. Well, thing because to have. I'm 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 thinking, I'm I'm thinking of the Seven Eleven or right, the you know, I mean, I I I mean those those places, <laughs> nice face, Dennis. Uh, you know, I mean those those places, vehicular traffic. Right is what you know is what drives the place, and you know I think if you're going for density, if you're going for walkability, it it's really the same argument we had over drive-throughs. It's you know how do you you know how do you make a a, a mixed use um, pedestrian friendly environment when at the same time you are um, you know encouraging businesses that are heavily traffic oriented. Yeah, but I'm not convinced that they are. I know I'll stop talking after this, but I, like I said, these Burlington area neighborhood markets are are not that, and I think that well, you could make the same. Dense. I don't know that that's a convenience but, but I think, store either. I mean, but I think the, you could make the same argument that a regular grocery I mean, store or clothing store is just as traffic centric as a convenience store, and why and. You know, we assume that those will be part well, of our, our I mean, makeup, maybe you know? it's me. I mean, maybe it's me and you know, how I grew up. I mean, small, you know, small stores around the corner, you know, that, that, that had, you know, small selections of, of groceries or specialty meat shops or things like that. I mean, they were they were anchors in the community, whereas the 7-Eleven, right, that, that is just getting people off the highway, right, they get their slurpee and off they go, <coughs> right, are, are not anchors of... You know, the the community they are. How about the Stewart uh, shops? They they, they, they are they, they are they are parasites of of the uh, you know the interstate highway system basically. Yeah. So so how do we? So, so I, I I agree with Joe in that I kind of agree with both. So what I heard you say about that store, I I envision that type of store maybe scattered throughout the larger village growth area. If you've got a big development, what's to say you can't have a quarter market? So I'm okay with that. But what I am against is what Joe's getting to about the drivability. So maybe it's a thing about parking lots and something like that that helps drive that design. I don't know. But I get what you're saying, and I agree with you. I wouldn't want to just see up 116, you've got these quick little pull-in, park, grab your stuff, get back out, pull back out, keep going. Mm -hmm. um, so how do, how do we regulate around that? Yeah, I think you back know? at the one that was up on uh, Richmond Road um, before you got to Iroquois. Oh, yeah. And, uh, yeah, Shop. Yeah, Trancher Shop. Um, she put, you know, it wasn't economically feasible. No, it was too And that's what to... happens with those. I, I remember where I grew up, but Joe's saying we had one across the street from where I live, but it's kind of a... They've gone by the wayside at the present time. A lot of them have. Some, some have. I mean, if, if no, they were just right. small like grocery the, stores, they're sorry. gone. If right? there's a lot of density if, and people can walk, like it, you're saying. Right. If you if, had a specialty like, you know, a, a certain, market, you know, right. Asian foods or, or specialty, you know, meat market mm -hmm. or. Right. You're, you're probably still there. True. You know. But the chain, yeah, the, it's. But they're not the chains that'll drive them out. Right. Something special. I think the one that Alex is talking isn't that a meat market too? Maybe I've got it confused with another no, one. No, it's just, just a, closer it's just to a, North Avenue. Just a corner mark market. 
Well, in any case, the I, Joe, the monkey wrench you threw in, basically, if I can paraphrase, was should we actually keep a convenience store use and restrict where it can go? Yeah. So look at the definition that that is here of convenience store. Is that something that you do want to limit where it can go? The one I came up with says a retail establishment of not more than 3,000 square feet that sells a limited selection of food, household items, newspapers, and magazines, prepared foods for off-site consumptions, and other sundries. Does not include restaurants, taverns, gas stations, or motor vehicle repair facilities. That would, um, that would bar, what is that, what is that place down in Bristol? Um, close to home or something that's all pre oh, that's prepared yeah. foods. Oh, North, North Street, I think it is. Yeah. That's like um, a little market, but it's also the green. a deli. Yeah, it's, it? it's near where the co-housing yeah. co housing is. Yep. Um, and they serve prepared foods for off-site consumption. Um, well, this definition allows for that. But that's included in the definition of a convenience store. Prepared foods for off-site consumption. But my question really was, if maybe you don't agree this should be the definition. Maybe the definition you want is more of the nasty 7-Eleven definition, and then we say there's only one place in Hinesburg you can put that, and it is where? Like, where do you want to allow that? W or, where there's already a gas station. So, the, the, so we have a gas station in the commercial... We have two. We have two in the commercial district. One at Ballard's. One on Commerce Street, and we have one gas station um, in the Village District, which does not function like a convenience store because it's just a service station. And what if you say, uh, "I like this one about Pigger, where they call it a convenience gas station." It's not a convenience store. So potentially using that definition and restricting it to the commercial district is that what you're going? Because if you want to make yeah. this use, you got to tell me where what district you want it to only be allowed in. And see, I, I want to find a way to, to keep retail, to remove the remove the whole idea of convention and, and merge them into one. But then write something around that kind of restricts the typical convention. When I'm thinking about, okay, it's a small store, but it has a parking lot and it's all you know it has in, in, in easy ingress and ingress and egress for automobiles. Something that limits walkability and goes counter to the vision type thing of walkability. Living. You know what I mean? That's, it's, it's about. We have general standards that speak to that. I'm not going to say right. that they would be absolutely hold up in a court of law to right. pro pro prohibit a, uh, what you're talking about. But right. our general village growth area purpose and all that talks about all that stuff. I, and my point is that even though there's an aversion to the 7-Eleven, um, you should have the same aversion to a Shaw's, to a, a gas station, to um, a Target. You know, to, there are all sorts of retail uses that are that could be designed to favor drive-in, drive-out, vehicular access to the detriment of our walkable community. So I think and I don't I, know that you I want to be specific that. about eliminating this use because it's you think it's dangerous it'd be better to have our design standards govern that for all uses but see i me and i know i'm you know on one side of the aisle here but it, I, if we can limit the size of parking lots and and vehicular ease of use i think that's a good thing now you can't eliminate it but i wouldn't encourage it i wouldn't encourage the the mega target store or you know well, and I didn't mean mega. I mean just a just a twenty thousand square foot target. Their new model, like you talked about, that, that they're designed to be mm -hmm. drive in, drive out. You know, uh, my anyways. My well, point they're, is, they're not. We're they're, talking they're designed about, to be community well, where in, you can walk to the in Heinsburg. They would be designed that way because we don't have the density to support a walk in, walk out target. Right. I mean, the market shed is small here. Right. In any but, case, but, what I'm saying is this t this conversation about design standards, I mm -hmm. think, is the better place to have to, to get what you want, which is design that favors walkability and, and discourages the drive in, drive out stuff across all uses, not just yeah. this particular retail use. Yeah, I just I want to try to avoid where 
116 becomes the proverbial interstate, if you will, you know, where it's pull off, get your stuff, and there's going to be some of that, but limited, you know. Yeah, I think what you pose, Alex, is interesting. If you put design standards around a retail, you know, store, right, um, and, you know, don't differentiate on, on size or um, content, I suppose that's another way to go. I mean, in in, in any any way we we do this, I would, you know, I, I I would like to feel comfortable that we are not going to encourage um, a plethora of, you know, small stores uh, of the Seven Eleven nature. Sorry, Seven Eleven. Uh, that you know, uh, basically form a form a wall along one sixteen. Uh, That's like in reality, there would be enough. I mean, we have the gas stations that have that type of, of grocery store, and if you tried to put a convenience store in Hinesburg right now, one sixteen, you've got a lot of competition. Yeah, but the, I, you I know. mean, I mean, but you know, look at drive on drive on Shelburne Road, you know. And, and it's like it's like bars. You you put a bar on one corner, mm. and, and and that spurs the bar on the opposite corner. You know, I mean, you know, a lot of gas stations are kitty corner to each other, and they compete on on price or whatever. Yep. So, I mean, it's I don't know the economics of it. I don't know if it's smart, but examples, you know, would would tell me that that's what occurs if I if I drive down the road. Road cuts play into this too. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So there's another thing to discuss. Yeah, I'm just trying to think of how do you how do you get what we want to achieve without you know it, it's across the board. It's not wow. just that type of of use. It, it's how do you get that livability, walkability, and, and get away from the commuter. I think thought. Yeah, I, you, you know, know I, I think that the one thing that occurs to me in this conversation is. This is really big topic. This isn't, this isn't yeah. easy, easily solvable in, right. you know, half an hour, an hour, however much longer we're going to be here. Um, I mean, it, one way. I, so, just to give you a hypothetical, right? And then we can move on. So, if I think of one sixteen, when I talk about the commuter mentality versus livable, walkable. Um, so today, you go down 116, there's a shoulder, and then if you want to go anywhere, you, you park. Well, what if instead of that, you had sidewalks and you could park on the side of the road, like, you know, a main downtown that, I know, you could think of many of them. But I think that is more conducive to livability and walkability, right? You, you, you What's the town? Um, Crystal, right? You go into their main part of town, into the main highway section, whatever that road is, and you pull in or pull off or parts of Virgins, right? And then you've got a sidewalk with shops and you walk up and down versus I'm pulling into a parking lot, running into the store, running back out, and then, okay, now I'm going to drive over here and go to that shop. That's the type of design well, does, and thought it, process it I'm thinking down, It of, does slow down traffic, right? but B-Trans won't let... We don't have parking. You I know. have parking. So I think we can... We don't have parking beside the road like Bristol, unfortunately. In my yes, opinion. but that's the type of thinking, and how do we do it within the constraints that we have I with one sixteen? Have that in we, well, we, we we have it in front of Kenny's. Right. <laughs> yeah. I think we could, Maggie. Actually, I don't. I don't think that they've ever said no to it. I think. Well, we used to have signs up that said you couldn't park there. Wasn't there a plan to put a one but, or two spaces in front? And, well, we're we're getting off I topic. Will, and, yeah, I will say that I know when. It, a few years ago, there were seemed like there were a lot of people coming in all the time that wanted to have restaurants before the public house got built. But the main constraint that why they didn't do it was there was no parking. That's what I heard from people when I was. So I, we but need see, parking beside the road. Well, well, I think, yes, but for many but reasons. Also, the the long term vision that I think is you have those restaurants because you've got people living densely there that could walk to said restaurant versus well, I think I'm building a restaurant with a parking lot. A lot there's always going to be people that drive there, but but the, there's a difference between designing for walkability mm -hmm. and having residential residential areas mm -hmm. where people can walk. Sure, you're going to have parking, but 
the concept is it's not designed around the idea of you will drive and park and go. It's designed around the idea that you are coming into a residential area where people live and work and you know what I mean? It's it's a it's a new No, I get what you mean. Vision. But a lot of us don't live in the village. Myself included. Not that I wouldn't love to. So But we have to drive. But that's the well that's okay, so parking. so what's the vision? Should we turn Heinsberg into Williston? Nope. You know? I no, mean that's, that's not what I'm saying. I'm right. just saying I, we I mean, need that's parking. an extreme thing, but you know what I mean? I, I don't think that's there needs to be parking it just doesn't need to be designed around the idea of everybody's driving in everybody's driving out there is people that live there and you can limit and slow traffic down and that's why i think parking beside the road would slow traffic down yes i think it would on each well. side and it would look so much more attractive yeah. I, I, I love bristol the way just, but that's what i that's what i would like mm -hmm. to see 116 Me become right you know? i agree with you I, mean, I wasn't disagreeing with you. Know, no, no, but you, there, that's a different thing than a big parking lot in front of a big yeah, store. Yeah, no, no, you know? that would be. So let me bring you back to why there was yeah. this Sorry. Was suggestion. The original <laughs> housekeeping change, was, this is what we said. It was um, in the commercial district, under the list of allowed uses, there's a permitted use that says retail establishments. Mm -hmm. There's a conditional use that says convenience or variety stores. There's no definition in the regulations of what a convenience or variety <laughs> store is. So the comment was, seems like a convenience store is just a special case of a retail establishment. We should consider collapsing them. If not, we should add definitions that clearly distinguish the two types of uses. Note, this issue carries over to the village and village northwest districts where retail shops and stores are an allowed use. Should does that mean we should be excluding convenience stores from the village and the village northwest district? So this gets to Joe's point of do you merge them and forget about it, or do you keep them distinct and keep convenience stores only in the commercial district and they're that, that way they can't sprout up and down 116 because the commercial district is not along 116. What do you want to do? I've given you definitions if you want to add one. There's, there's a way to collapse them if you want to collapse them. For me, personally, I would, I would go conservative. I, I, would, I would put a definition in for convenience store, limit it for now, have the discussion on design standards, decide if at that point, once we figure out what design standards are, you know, how we want to treat convenience stores. So, so, so have the definition right, right of convenience it. store and sort of kick down the road the discussion about right. I mean, whether to. I mean, yeah, I mean, put the definition in for a convenience store. Think about removing convenience stores from <coughs> Village Northwest and you know, Village Northeast and Village for now. <coughs> Hold the conversation on. So what design good. standards are, figure out how to treat these things, how to work in flexibility and walkability and yada, 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 and then revisit. I agree with that. It just it, it sets a standard until we can formalize right. design standards. So I agree with Joe. Um. We think that's that complicated. No. I mean. <laughs> but I like specificity. It'll be stall us. Um, because I, I basically think that whatever standards apply to a retail establishment uh, ought to uniformly apply to any kind of retail establishment. Okay. What standards do we have today? I, I guess those aren't in in uh, in, in, in abundance. Well, no, we, uh, no, no, no. We, we although have there's something there. We but. have design standards for the village growth area. There are site and building design standards. I can point you to the section. We we it's not that we don't have design standards. We do, but you'd like to improve them. That's what you've indicated, and we're supposed to be working on making them more specific. I guess I would say in the interim that. 
I'm, I'm definitely for, for merging these two and, mm -hmm. and sort of holding the bar wherever we think it ought to be held. I and agree. it ought to apply to both. Um, um, and, and if you all think, hey, this is going to take a little time to sort out properly, then I guess I'd defer. But. You might. I, mean, I think right now, Alex, retail establishments are permitted. Convenience stores are, are conditional. In the commercial district. In the commercial district. In the, other, in the village and village northwest, retail establishments are a use, and convenience stores are not listed. So if, if we define convenience store and we modify retail establishment definition to say does not include convenience stores, then that will effectively prohibit them from the village and the village northwest district until you can get your act together on design standards. And if we just if we just forgot about the definition of convenience stores, we'd basically say that convenience stores as a retail establishment can go anywhere. Any you know commercial commercial village or village northwest. northwest. Yeah. 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 Okay. Those three districts. So that's your that's your choice. I guess I'm in with those two boys. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody yeah. else sufficiently yeah, confused that. or agreeable with? That'll take care of it. Okay. So we can deal with it. Sorry, that was as torturous as it was. Obviously, we should have talked about that at a meeting when last last class. June. I could have been in and out of that shop and all that, that time. That was not a convenient yeah, discussion. Yeah. That was not a convenient <laughs> conversation. Yes, yeah, she could have gotten two or three by now. So um, the only other one that I was going to suggest as a housekeeping change was something you haven't talked about. So I am re retracting my suggestion. I want to be I want to be done with this. It had to do with the definition of abandonment. Um, let's just deal with it another day. Another 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 set of zoning changes. Wait, you're, you're you're abandoning. I'm abandoning, abandoning that conversation. Yeah. Well, that could go on for a long time. Is that an allowed use? Abandonment. No, it's not an allowed use. <laughs> So I think you're done. Um, I would propose that I, I tidy this up, and if you want to see it before it goes to the select board so you can make a motion on a clean document, I'd be happy to clean, uh, yeah. get it ready for your next meeting. Okay. You okay. know, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to say discuss this now, but one, one thing we talked about was, like, demolition in, in the, the village district, and that might have gotten lost at some point about permits for that. And yeah, I know we talked about that. I have notes on that, and um, let me make another note to check and see what happened with that. It may have been in the category of, uh, let's talk about this further outside of these housekeeping changes, because that's a big enough deal that we should, you know, not just slip it slip it in as a minor tweak. Don't they have to get a permit to demolish no. I mean, o only, only if it's, if it's like, like historical. historic. Right. But, but when when we talked about this before, I for one brought up, well, you know, what about what about like the safety and the the housekeeping you know, change the, was that there's a conditional use review process for demolition of mm -hmm. of older structures in the in the village growth area, but the zoning permit, uh, what you need a zoning permit for a section of the reg says you need a permit to demolish uh, a structure. A principal structure, I think, in the village area, not a, not just an old one. And so, I think Peter actually raised right. this as a, yeah. why is there a difference between those two? And so we had talked about, well, let's just get rid of the fact that you need a zoning permit for demolition of any structure, because we really just want it for older ones. And it was at that point that Joe said, no, wait a minute, maybe you do want review of demolition mm -hmm. when it's close to neighbors and might have hazardous materials well, hazardous materials just the logistics i'll, I'll make know. a note to check my my brain is telling me that we were going to kick that down the road but okay. may, maybe not because there's got to be a finish line joe somewhere not where i work <laughs> never done Are you okay with me getting you a clean copy for the next meeting? Or, or yeah? Okay. Okay. I think we're on to item number four on the agenda.
size limit for retail establishments. So just to tell everybody, it's about 10 after 9. And uh, we should really do minutes tonight, too. So right. I don't have much to give you in terms of an update from the select board. They did discuss it with uh, uh, the legal counsel on Monday night. Um, they came out of that in mm. closed session and, and just said, we discussed it, and we'll talk about it at a regular meeting down the road. Probably their first meeting in February is, I think, when they were going to take it up again. So that's all I have to share. Okay. I've got a question about that. Um, so you've said that as soon as Hannaford submits another application, they will be judged under those. The Whatever regulations are in place at the time, that, that was my understanding. Yep. I thought that in our discussions about uh, adjusting the village design standards that I was under the impression that we have some might have some influence over what the proposed developments uh, in, in the village northwest are going to look like we we would and so the the reason is is that um, as it as council has explained to us um, you uh, an applicant vests in the regulations that are in place uh, when they submit a complete application. For the Hannaford project, the only, well, pretty much the principal review that was necessary was called site plan review. And so when they submitted their application back in 2010, it was a complete application for that review. When uh, the three big <coughs> projects uh, came in for review, they were being reviewed as subdivisions and to some extent planned unit developments and those reviews are multi-step review process. So site plan review is one-stop shopping. You walk in with your application, the board could potentially be done with you in one meeting. Hannaford took two years, it was all different. But um, subdivision review is intended to have a conceptual level review at the first stage and then a much more complete review at later stages. And council advised us that that initial sketch plan review, conceptual level review stage uh, does not constitute a complete application, and so nobody vests at that stage. So none of those three big projects have vested yet in any regulation. So if anything gets passed, uh, at least according to our legal counsel, legal opinions do change over time, and other precedent can come up, but that's, that's what they advise, that we still do have some um, power of, in terms of changing the regs. All right. Thank you. Next steps on normal zoning revision process. I think, isn't it typical? Schedule, discuss, decide. Well, yeah, I, I mean, you, you, you are taught, you have been talking about four or five or even six different pieces of village growth area rezoning. Um, Jeff had suggested that this size cap be, you know, one of the first items to discuss. Uh, there are a couple others that you had pretty good discussion on that you're just waiting for me to draft some language on. So what I need to know and what I think you need to know is um, if this size limit for retail establishments is something you really want to get clarified in the zoning, forget about the interim bylaw for a moment, right? You've made your recommendation that's out of your hands. But the regular zoning process, how do you want to proceed on that? Like, do you want to assign a couple of commissioners to do some legwork on that or work with me on that? Is there a particular level of community input you want to get? Um, um, and maybe, and maybe more importantly, just what's your schedule? Like, would you like to, this to be the topic that you talk about at your next couple meetings? Or do you want to... Do, you know, there. Do you want to get back to those other items like the mixed use definition, um, the official map revisions, things like that? Like, I'm I'm, mm. I, I'm trying to gauge where you, how you want to schedule it. How dominant do you want this size limit to become in terms of your ongoing discussions? I think we had our discussion. We should just want a hearing. Mm, we're not. Well, that's one option. Mm. <laughs> I mean, I, I I don't think this is nearly as simple as just change a number. I I think that if you're, I mean, 
I think that if you're going to change that number, you also have to have a vision um, that's agreed to. And I, I'm not not saying it, it has to take a year to develop, but I, I'm, yeah, you know, I'm only one person on the board, but I'm I'm not ready to, you know, vote on something that would, um, you know, be good for a a public hearing, you know, two weeks from now. Um, that's kind of that's kind of in the realm of interim zoning, you know, faster action than than this board normally takes up. On the same time, what I said last last meeting was, if we got into the interim zoning recommendation, which we did, right, then it really behooves us to put that first, right, have that discussion, you know. Um, I can't say that it was important enough to vote for interim zoning and then turn around and say, yeah, but we really ought to do, you know, X, Y, or Z first. So, yeah, I think I think we should be discussing this next couple of meetings. How long that takes, I don't know. It depends on nine people around this table. Yeah, I'd agree with that. The, the focus be on that. I think there are nuances to this. I'm sorry I wasn't at the last meeting. But, you know, I think there's, in, at least in looking at the minutes, there's some brief conversation about multiple story buildings. What exactly yeah. does that 20,000 square foot limit mean? Yeah. Or any limit? Yeah. Um, does that mean, you know, there are lots of grocery stores. You go to Healthy Living, they've probably got half their square footage on the second floor. Uh, to most yeah. North Americans, that appears to be preposterous. But, uh, you know, if we're talking about efficient land use uh, right. within our village district and the extended village district right. and then exactly you know you've got a lot of symbiotic relationships in retail where right. you know, you've got minor little connections between two establishments that maybe differ slightly um, but that basically perhaps under mm -hmm. un, un, under one uh, yep. mm -hmm. name what, what about so multi business I, buildings things like there are you know, lots of I mean, connective tissues that, we, that that actually could uh, work quite beneficially. So I think there are nuances in this that are much more than just saying, hey, here's the limit. You know, you've, you've got a tradition of uh, retail establishments in this state, actually, that are multiple stories. And, yep. um, you know, so is that that 20,000 square foot limit? Is that just to the footprint? I, I don't see the word footprint anywhere in any of the dialogue that we're having thus far. And I, I, so I think there's subtleties to the conversation that yeah. I think we ought to explore and give ourselves the time to do that. I agree, Ralph. Well. Um, I agree. Me too. If we can stay focused, I mean, I, I would, you know, just throw in a, um, because, you know, how long was it? It seems several times in the past <laughs> five years we, we've discussed mixed use, we've discussed density, but we haven't. I mean, we we have nothing to show for it. We keep having these freeform conversations, which are which are great. But what's <coughs> what's our what's our goal? I mean, I I, I just don't want to have a couple of great discussions and then, you know, um, as uh, has happened, tangible. yeah, nothing nothing tangible. So well, I think that's where James's suggestion is is a good one in the sense of. Uh, Maybe your goal should not be the conversation, but your goal should be to get to a proposal that you can warrant for a hearing and, and give yourself a schedule to do that. If, like Joe said, you, you, you as a commission felt right. it was important enough to recommend an interim emergency measure that the psych board may or may not act on. So, well, then that is a good so, idea. So maybe, like Joe said, so, you talk about it your next two meetings with the, with the idea that after that, what, what are those two meetings? Those would be your two February meetings that right. by... Your first meeting in March, you know, you're, you've given your planner enough information to give you a draft mm -hmm. to look at so that maybe you could have a hearing by the end of March or the first meeting in April, something like that. But where can... We... <laughs> um, that's great. I'm not arguing about any of that. I just, I really like what Ralph said. I just feel like I know nothing about this. And th that I have a lot to learn. And what are, you know, where are they doing this in other places? Like, I think the multi-floor thing is a great idea. 
And how will we get educated on this? Are, are we going to find out what other places do, and what where are those other places? Do you know, yeah. Do you follow my? Those are some of my questions. Well. But I'm going to be gone for the next two meetings, by no. the way. Oh, no. <laughs> but I will watch oh, it on TV. Oh, then we're not going to bother educating. No, <laughs> you guys will do just fine, I'm sure, without me. But I, I'll watch the meetings. So I would, I would uh, ask, yeah. at, and you're all volunteers, so you can, you can, you know, tell me to buzz off because I'm the guy who you're paying. But I would ask that you would, you identify one or two commissioners who, who are going to dig into this and do some additional work or reading. A research outside yes, of this saying. room and be able to come back at the next two meetings and say this is what I learned from uh, what the city of Burlington does right. or what I read about Des Moines Iowa you know right. on Google um, and 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 I'm happy to help and try to beat bushes as well on that front um, but I think it would help if, if somebody took ownership um, and and did some work outside of the meeting itself the next so, Jeff's all over it. All right. Yeah. So we're talking the 14th and um, Valentine's Day. the 28th. Yeah. Gotta cancel that meeting. Oh. What? Somebody <laughs> might bring you cookies. So I want to ask a question, but I don't want it to go down a rat hole discussion of this meeting. Because so far, even convenience stores, I turn into massive discussions. <laughs> um, so, boo! Yeah. <laughs> so, so part of my twenty thousand square foot thing was about continuity. Right. Right. It's a requirement in the village districts. Why not have it right. in the commercial district? So, m my broader thought was, what would it take if if the simple measure for continuity's sake was just get rid of the commercial district and merge it with village northwest and village or village growth that already we've defined descent, you know current density, current building types, current structure types, and just absorbed the commercial district into that. So a couple things. It won't obviate the need to have the discussion about the square footage limit. Correct. Because there's nothing that says that the 20,000 square foot cap in the village in the village northwest is the right number. Right? Maybe it should be 15. Maybe it should be 26. I mean, th I think that discussion still needs to happen uh, as long as the nuances that Rolf mentioned. Mm -hmm. But two... Um, it's a, it's a much easier discussion to have about extending, you know, a square footage limit to an existing district than blowing away the district altogether and having okay. it be absorbed. It, it to, you can certainly do that. And we've talked about that in the past. Um, but there's a whole host of differential uses that are allowed convenience right. stores being one of them, mm -hmm. um, in the commercial district that if you merge that district, right. you've got to make some decisions about, is it, is it really going to have all the same blend of uses or not? Um, and what things, what things do we, do we need to carry from the commercial district into the village districts mm -hmm. if they're going to be the same zoning or, or, or you know what I mean? So we can have that conversation. It's it's more complicated. Okay. Yeah. Because my my main focus on even going down this path was about continuity with the rest of the vision of the village growth area, you know. And it's kind of this odd little own island in the middle of it all. So yeah, well, I was just thinking of what are because I'm looking at both. Let's talk about it. But in my mindset of get value quicker. You know, and doing the, okay, well, here's part one, here's part two, versus us spending the next six months going through this huge conversation. Y you know what I mean? It, and I think those are valuable conversations to have, but I'd like to see us move forward, even if it's a little bit along the way, versus, you know, in this discussion. So I'm, I'm kind of, you know, what's the, what's the method to get it blended in, this, in a simple reasonable way uh, while we have these larger I discussions think the way about to design do that is, and vision is and... not to blow away the district yeah. but to but to refine the design standards and that means not just size limits on retail use but um, multi-story requirements if you want there to be some mixed use requirements building position on lots in relation to frontage you know the the kind of ro more robust design standards that we were also going to discuss and have those design standards encompass the commercial district as well as the village. Right now, there are different design standards for right. the two districts as well as the size limit cap on retail. 
So rather than, I would say the easier discussion is fix the design standards so that you get what you want everywhere while retaining the basic difference between the allowed uses in that commerce okay. district fair. versus okay. the village. I'm not saying you don't want to eventually get rid of those districts, but I think that's a that's a longer, more difficult conversation. Okay, to have. and that's what I'm getting at. What's it, it, it's about continuity. So how do we move forward with that without it turning into you know? I mean, I think design standards and what we're talking about is not a quick conversation. No. So I don't want to like, okay, well, this is phase one of the design standard conversation. It's more this is about getting continuity and then starting those broader discussions across the board. So it would be, here it is, and then it could change in a year, mm -hmm. you know? But that, you know, I would just like to see yeah, something know, of value happen, you know, and get passed versus, because that's kind of my concern with this whole size of it was we just never got to looking at that to get that continuity because we're talking about all these other things and even then we're sort of so well, that's you know I, I think some of the exploration that maybe these one or two people do mm -hmm. on our group here uh, with Alex's help is some <coughs> understanding uh, I think we have a general understanding of what we have in town but I couldn't tell you say for example maybe some people here could uh, if you look at Commerce Park right now is there a building in that zoning district mm -hmm. that exceeds 20,000 square feet footprint. There is Nesdaq? No. You no. think Nesdaq is no. more than 20,000 no, square feet? Not footprint. Obishan Plaza is the largest Plaza, at, at 19,000. 19, okay. right. What's the footprint area of uh, NRG, say, for example, oh. which sits right nearby? Oh, yeah. It's more uh, than that. I, th I want to say it's like... 40, 40, I'm just saying 45 that information is right. helpful to me in understanding right. the context of that 20,000 square foot we conversation. Can get you that. So we should talk about it because my when we first started talking about it, one of the notes I had was like, you know, footprints 10,000, max 20,000, something along those lines. But Well, and also as a point of reference, I mean, I look at the meeting and it says here that Bill Marks said, um, it may have been misunderstood, that Kinney's was a 20,000 square foot establishment. Mm -hmm. It's only it's 10. Not, no. Yeah. Um, so, I think it's to all have the same facts at our disposal mm -hmm. is a big help in expediting the conversation. Okay. And then, so, as Alex there's suggested... A, there's, a, there's a great document that Alex sent out to everybody. That, mm -hmm. And, and okay. so, you, so whoever volunteers doesn't get to do that easy work, I get to do that. Because I have all those numbers. Han the Hannaford Project actually elucidated that. There was some evidence submitted. I don't know if it was Hannaford or Responsible Growth Heinsberg. One of the parties took pictures of and explained the sizes of all the structures in, mm -hmm. in, in Commerce Park. Uh, well, I th but it was entered into evidence. Um, so I think it mm -hmm. might have been one of those parties as well. But but in any case, we we have that data. So I, I can so, provide so that at I the next meeting. So I can volunteer for, for something and whoever else. Well, Jeff, I mean, Jeff also volunteered. So maybe what a coincidence. Those are the two We're sitting people. right next to each other. Yeah. I rub off on. And our last names are kind of alpha in alphabetical <laughs> order, depending on which way you're going around the room. So maybe we can talk about what how to divvy this up and yeah. Yeah. Um let's Can we talk tomorrow? No. Yes. Maybe. What time? <laughs> I can make a conference call happen, uh, so we can do it by phone. I just Thursday. Thursday. I knew that. Okay. I did. You, you had a comment, Johanna. Sometimes um, I don't like things. Um, Johanna White. Thank you. I. Uh, this is going to sound really weird, but I go all the way back to when we did the the official map, and we designated that particular jewel of a space in the middle of the town as something that the town should own for its own purposes. It could be um, a, a park of some sort, maybe this a skating rink on the wetland. Uh, there were a number of things. But to me, in my heart, this is the, the, the argument is still that basic argument, that piece of land should not be created in the image of anything other than itself for the for the the enjoyment of the town for the the pleasure of it 
And I, I and, understand the comment. Yeah. I mean, the first thing I would say is, we lost on that I, count. I, I brought that to Act Two Fifty. I understand. Right. I got. I got soundly thrashed. Yeah. In, in in that meeting. I know. Right. I know and you know, I, I think no matter what the statute says, that is that is long water underneath the bridge. Well, and it wasn't just Act 250. The, the Development Review Board voted f four to three. It was split, but they voted, and the majority saw, thought that the proposal accommodated the official map because of the little bit of green space for the farmer's market and the shared parking right. and all that. I, I learned a lot about official maps and, and funding over, over that whole exercise. But, can I just make a comment? With that said, um, we still don't know where... Like Alex just said, where things stand with Hannaford's, mm -hmm. but say that dies, maybe what you're saying could be reinvigorated yeah. again. It so it might not be <laughs> really. I mean, well, I don't. I mean, it it's still on the map. the The official yeah. map hasn't changed, and we I still don't have a financial model well, for paying but, for stuff in place. So. Um, the your group has appeared to be very successful in raising money, or I don't know how much you've raised, but who knows? 300000 I mean, See? I, I mean, I'm jumping way ahead. Yes, mm -hmm. but, we are already there. But, no, and that's wonderful. So, who knows? We just don't know what's going to happen with Hannaford's, mm -hmm. but that's true. it could, it could be dead. We don't know. Joanna, did you have a suggestion for the commission with re with with regard to your sort of I, statement I about the value of that property? Right. Is there something you want them to do well, be, in order to move in that direction? I guess I don't want to lose sight of the fact that that, that particular piece of land should not be used in any other way than what we had decided to do with it. What was that? 12 years ago? 2009 is when we adopted the official map. So, however long ago that was, it? yeah. So nine I, years it, ago. It's, you know, I know that I know that this is pipe dreams in the air where Hannaford is concerned. It, to me, it's not about Hannaford. It's about that piece of land. It's not about you know. I shop in Hannaford in a number of different towns when I can't get to Lampman's. If I'm in another place, that's where I go. I would go. So it's not, I, I just dislike the fact that it's become Hannaford against RGH or whatever. Right. It's not what it is. Right. I mean, the, the only thing I can say is that lot is still on the official map. Nothing has changed mm -hmm. there. And, and when this board talks about regulation, in, in the commercial district, it's really talking about regulation throughout the commercial district. And, and the two are really separate, parallel planning tools that are, are you know, working here. One of the, both of which you're looking to update. There's, this commission has talked last year about updating <coughs> the official map to give it more specificity in the hopes that it would be and, a more powerful document in the future. <laughs> and, and suggesting to the, the select board that a financial... Um, aspect of that needs to be put together too so that we can answer a question in the affirmative if they ask if we have any capital backing the next time something like this comes up. Thank you for listening. Um, should we talk about uh, the 14th, which is our next meeting? Is that? Uh, it sounds like you want to talk more about the size retail size limit, right? And the three of us are going to do a little work in advance of that. But is open. anyone going to show up if it's the 14th? Yeah. My wife doesn't like me. Oh, stop that. <laughs> You're on camera, Joe. I know. <laughs> but she won't watch. Do you not bake? Do you not bake enough? Is that what's going on at home? Well, I mean, that's a valid question for any meeting, but I suppose this one is a Hallmark holiday, so... Uh, I mean, I don't care, but... You, you'll be here? Anybody not going to be here? Because they have a, well, we know, yes. And I, I almost think that, this is back to John, but I almost think he said he wouldn't be here for the next two meetings. Does anybody recall that? So it's possible he won't be here for that one, too. But I, I could be totally wrong. Just mentioning it. Well, I mean, 
Um, board, board has to operate, you know, one member down, two members down. Right. I'm just mentioning. Just saying. Sounds like everybody else can. I'm going to blow kisses. Yeah. I'm so pleased <laughs> don't. Maybe you'll have to bake, Joe. Oh, but you look too tired. Yeah, Stra Joe does not need. He's not into that right he now. He does not need one more thing on his to-do right. list. Right, yes. So. I'm, I take that back. So, so my hope you then would be, be to, yeah. to right. provide so some to some information no. for discussion yeah. uh, for that meeting, as well as a clean copy of the housekeeping changes, so you can hopefully just make a very quick motion to uh, forward the proposed housekeeping changes regulation revisions to the select board, mm -hmm. and then it gets them in their lap. So when they're done the budget in a couple weeks, they have something else they can look at, in addition to your interim bylaw suggestion. Okay. Um, yes, there are two of them, the January 10th and December 13th. All right, let's do them in order. December 13th first. So this was public hearing night. Anybody have updates? I thought it was great. Yeah, very helpful. Um, anybody want to make a motion? So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Abstain. Abstain. Okay, looks like uh, we passed 12 13. Let's so move on to. Uh, Tenth. That that reference that somebody, that Rolf, you made about Bill Marx's statement on page six. Yes. In the fourth paragraph, says mm -hmm. Bill Marx, member of the public, said that after that after the hearing mm -hmm. that Kinney Drugs building was approximately twenty thousand square feet. He now wonders if the town should be considering a smaller cap. I'm my recollection was that he actually knew it was. 10,000 or 11,000 square feet. I'm wondering, Don, if that, if, if, if maybe you meant to type 10,000 square feet. No, I, I think he said video post it. So she was, was strictly off my notes. Mm. <laughs> yeah, I think that that's what he said. Alex. Is it worth putting a. Um... Well, because I swear he, I swear he knew how big it was. I, I, I think he was. Uh, but that's all right. We can leave it there. I, I think she, that it's right. Is it okay. worth putting in, in brackets? It looks up for an editorial comment. We I would like that. So that it's not it's I mean, because just saying that it's a large. Can, is it can I? That might it, be the best way to do it. Is just to say Bill Mark said that after hearing Kenny how how large Kenny Drugs the Kenny Drugs building was yeah. that he now wonders if the town should be considering a smaller cap on retail square footage. Then you don't have to get into the mm -hmm. actual number. Because that was his intent, was, right? Was the, He's basically just I saying, it was along those lines. The, the, yeah. I thought Kinney's was a really big building, and it turns out it's smaller than our cap. Mm -hmm. they'll, they'll have to go to VCAM to get disinformation. Is that it? Yeah. I think that's what he said. Well, if that's what he said, the minutes are supposed to reflect what someone said. Mm -hmm. um, it's just, you know, it's probably not a big deal. Right, but minutes don't have to be a transcript of what they said. They can yeah. summarize, especially if there's a question about what the actual wording was. But your call, that was the only thing I wanted to bring up because I noticed that too. I'd hate to keep the wrong size in there. Well, why don't you just put just in parentheses? You can't change what he's, you shouldn't change what he said. Well, but you can, I, 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 like, I like Maggie's idea. You can put an editorial comment. Oh, if, okay. if it's in brackets, yeah. you can. Yeah, it, yeah um, just note, Guinea's is 10,342.56 square feet. <laughs> it's 11,766. Is it? Yeah. Okay, yeah. I was under the impression that he 
it was he was surprised that Kenny was below twenty thousand square Correct. feet, and that's when he was like, "Oh, maybe it should even be lower than 20. And that's exactly what that his, was. What I was getting why, out of that comment. That's why I think it'd be better to generalize that sentence yeah. so as not to put the words in his <clears> mouth that that aren't. That's not what he meant. What he meant was, I thought Kenny's was was twenty thousand, right. and so we should right. have a smaller cap. And it does look larger because of the way the roof line is. But when you actually look at it closely, it's yeah. not as big as you would think driving by. So is the generalized curvature correct? What Maggie said. <laughs> Maggie suggested brackets, brackets. not and generalized wording. Behind the 20,000, even though we're not sure that that's exactly yep. what he said. Yes, just make sure the brackets have what well how should she do that, Maggie? Should it say recording secretary notes that or I mean the brackets have to be associated with somebody besides Bill Marks, yeah, they right? Do. Um, I mean I could go review the video and change it to be accurate. <laughs> no, I I think just put putting the I, mean, I yeah. would I would just put like bracket town town records indicate that Kenny's is you know so many square feet. Yeah, that works. Good. Mm -hmm. Eleven thousand. All right, Alex, I ask you to repeat the sample list. Eleven seven six six. If you want, you could even put a sentence after Bill's statement saying, Alex said it was 11766. I know those words came out of my mouth. I don't know yes. if anybody heard them, but. Because I knew what the, because I, I, I had it written down. Yeah. and uh, We're not conforming again. What's that? It's making a joke. It's too I, late for jokes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Any other amendments to 110? I have a motion. So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Okay, thanks. All right, so minutes is done. Um, any other business, Alex? Uh, just two items of correspondence. Johanna left, but she did, uh, she did provide this document. It's addressed to the Heinz, Joe Idenza and the Heinsberg Planning Commission. So take one and pass it around. I don't know that it needs any discussion. Just I wanted you to have it. Put it in your digital Dropbox folder as well this afternoon. It's basically... It's, it's basically... It's in, the, it's in the Dropbox? Uh, it's a letter from Johanna saying... Um, here's here's a copy of a report oh. that Responsible Growth Heinsberg. It's the same. I just passed it in two directions. Sorry. Um, it, it so it's a letter from her saying this is a report that Responsible Growth Heinsberg uh, uh, had done by uh, a hydrologist uh, disputing some of Hannaford's most recent uh, stormwater plan and the state permit that they recently got. She thought it was relevant to your discussion about the 20,000 square foot size cap. So, and then the other piece so of course. the building was only 20,000 square foot, that would take care of the stormwater issue? I have no idea. I am not a stormwater expert. I couldn't tell you that. Well, I thought that's what this document was about. No, you, if you read the actual report that's attached, you'll see that it has nothing to do with the 20,000 square foot limit. It has. Oh, it, well, I said right here, it said. Submits a copy of the report for the planning commission in consideration of the request. Right. right. I think her point is, uh, if it wasn't such a big project, it probably wouldn't have these issues. But it's such a big project, it does. Oh. But I don't know which at what square footage amount it might not have those problems. She probably doesn't know either. But um, in any case, there you have it. Uh, and then the final thing is the town of Williston just provided a notice about a public hearing they're having on some regulation changes that they are making. They're having their hearing on February 6th. So if you're interested, here's the notice. I put it um, on the Dropbox as well, along with the details of the change. Doesn't have anything to do with us or our border region, I don't think so. I don't, I'm not sure it's all that relevant, but they're required to notify us. You are hereby notified. I only had 
one thing um, I've been exceedingly bad at email lately, but um, I, I did intercept a note from Brian Mayer today um, from Sun Common. He just kind of, oh, hello, we're going to be in Hinesburg. I'd like to meet with you and find out, you know, what's going on in Hinesburg and what people think. So what? I haven't answered him. Okay. So I'll, I'll tell you how I answered him, Joe. I got okay. the same email. My, my answer was, hey, if you're just doing typical residential, you know, marketing and installations, I don't need to meet with you. Go, go, yep. go do good things. There's lots of rooftops, yep. and if you can't do them there, then, you know, Thank maybe you. in people's yards. I said, if you want to, if you're interested in doing larger scale net metered projects and or industrial scale, I would like to talk to you because the town has some ideas about where those uh, maybe would be the, a good place to go. I believe he's talking about just doing outreach to residents. On kind of sounded that way. Residential yeah. stuff, which I don't, I mean, it's nice of him to reach out, but I, I don't want to yep. have a meeting with him about that. Maybe refer him to the Energy Committee? I did. That, that's, that's also what I did. I said, <laughs> I am blind copying the Energy Committee, and if they're interested, then one of them will get uh, back to you. They did try at one point to do a larger one, because I did get a call from somebody about that, and then I heard about it from the landowner, but I don't think it went anywhere. That was a year or two ago. Not to discourage you from meeting with him, Joe. Yeah, no, understood. Just filling you in with what's going on. Huh? Just him. filling you in with what's what's going on. Yeah. I saw in the paper they got the McGee Hill project though. Yeah. Mm -hmm. the solar panels and everything. I yes, so it, I saw the paper. Yeah. Big aerial picture. So there was a lot of planning commission discussion about that. I would recommend not mm -hmm. now, but in, uh, well, I guess now wouldn't be a bad time too, but especially in June when all the vegetation mm -hmm. actually has leaves on it, yeah. Yeah. Um, go see, see it and yeah. see, how it, yeah. see how it came out. Because I, 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 I haven't, yeah, no. I will tell you that, that the gentleman who built my barn for me, Tim Isham, lives up on McGee Hill and... Uh, um, he is unhappy. Um, he brings that up. He brought it up a lot when, when he was over at the house working. But that's kind of a family issue too. Well, I don't understand all that. You know, I only been here thirty years. It's pretty visible. <laughs> yeah. I've been one hundred and thirty. Yeah. It's pretty well. I haven't been by it's pretty visible. Meters. Yeah. yeah. From driving on the road, I don't know what it's like mm -hmm. when you go up the hill a little bit. So opposite. It's big. Personally, yeah. blends in a lot better than I expected it to. Yeah, that's what. But definitely go take a look, yeah. and and also remember that when we did the solar screening regulations that Len Duffy encouraged us to do, I think you had a provision that said the landscaping has to achieve its function within five years. Mm -hmm. So, look at it now, and then remember that well, maybe I should come back and look at it in a few years because it's mm -hmm. possible, just like a logging job or a new subdivision, that it looks pretty nasty at the front end, and maybe in a. Couple I'm years. Sure younger people not do that. I'm not sure Can about. you put that on our, <laughs> on our calendar? Five years. We'll go for a I, absolutely. I have one, I have one of these. I can make a reminder. Actually, can you go up there and like take monthly, monthly pictures? Yeah. <laughs> no. Let's just put a webcam. All right. Um, motion to adjourn. So moved. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.